Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Cohen and on today's episode I have Dr. Will Cole. Dr. Cole graduated from Southern California University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles. He has a postdoctorate education and training in functional medicine and clinical nutrition. He specializes in clinically investigating underlying factors and customizing health programs for chronic conditions such as thyroid issues, hormonal dysfunctions, digestive disorders and more. He is also the author of the book Ketotarian, the mostly plant-based plan to burn fat, boost your energy, crush your cravings, and calm inflammation. Will, thanks so much for coming on for an episode for today. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. So, yeah, we're just speaking off there, there, off there, uh, there. <laughs> how um, you had a glowing review from one of my previous um, episodes, um, guests, Dr. Carrie Dioulis, and she was seen to someone who was asking her about type 1 diabetes and following a vegan keto way of uh, eating that um, if anyone wanted a, a book to follow, it's your book, Ketotarian. And yeah, so investigating you a little bit more and reading a bit about the book, I, I knew I had to get you on because you just fit right into the the way that people like listening on the show. So um, I think um, yeah. the first question I'd like to ask though is, what is a Ketotarian? So Ketotarian is my play on words, right? It's this amalgamation of the best of being plant-based and the best of being in ketosis of being fat adapted. And someone had pointed out to me a few weeks ago that in, with Ketotarian, I created a, a celebrity couple name like Brangelina, you know, uh, <laughs> I didn't intend to do that, but <laughs> I think Ketotarian will last longer than maybe that, that relationship did. But, uh, it is, really born out of my experience in functional medicine and what works and what doesn't and how can you really leverage the benefits of ketosis, which is so much exciting science around that, and the benefits of being plant-based, which is has a lot of long-term studies there too that are uh, exciting from a, a health standpoint. Uh, so that's what it is. It's not dogmatic. It's not um, one way or, or or not, there's vegan keto, vegetarian keto, and pescatarian keto options, but all plant-centric uh, and all keto. So that's really what ketotarian is. Okay, and did you um, come to this way of eating more from a ketogenic approach, or were you more either vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian and then became ketogenic? So I grew up in a, in a, as a kid, uh, knowing about health and wellness. My parents were into it. I was drinking like weird adaptogenic tonics in the eighties <laughs> before there was Instagram and taking pretty pictures of them. I was just doing it, uh, in outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania growing up. And then, uh, I learned about the, f the food industry as a teenager and I became a vegan myself. Um, for about 10 years and I write about it in ketotarian, but, but basically yeah, it was better than the standard American diet, but the way that I was eating a vegan diet, uh, which was just by default, what was out there was real food, but it was a lot of carbohydrates, um, a lot of grains and vegetables, obviously too, but pr primarily depending on carbs for energy, um, which over time impact my energy levels, impact my digestion, uh, and just inflammation levels, uh, you know, generally speaking. And that was so ketotarian before I called it ketotarian was really the natural evolution of being a higher carb vegan uh, eater to um, being fat adapted, but still being plant centric. But that's also the time that I brought in more wild caught fish and things that were pescatarian and vegetarian with eggs and ghee into my diet. So but I still with the book, I wanted to give people still vegan keto options if they wanted to be entirely vegan keto, but I just bring up the science in ketotarian of, well, these are some things to at least consider uh, as far as the bioavailability of the omega fats in fish versus in flax and the bioavailability of fat soluble vitamins in fish and, and eggs versus just being entirely plant-based. So that's why the subtitle of ketotarian is the mostly plant-based. You can be entirely vegan if you want to, but I didn't want to offend any hardliner vegans and say, well, when they open it up and see a picture of, you know, a fish, if, if they choose to do it, it's not going to be something where they're going to be super volatile against me. I don't want to offend anybody, but this is just 
what I've seen work in myself and what I've seen work in thousands of patients over the years too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how was that personal experience then when being strictly vegan for so long and then introducing some animal-based products? Oh, I noticed a dramatic change in my health and as far as uh, inflammation levels going down and that's subjectively just how I felt, but also labs improving as well and um, more energy levels and just overall improving health, both how I felt and lab improvement. So this is something that I just saw work for me and that really the heart of functional medicine is finding out what works for somebody and what doesn't. And that, that should be your focus and not being so allegiant to one way for everybody because you'll be proven wrong all day long as a doctor if you hang your hat on one way to doing that. So I wanted to still encapsulate nuance and customization under the umbrella of being plant-based keto and ketotarian so people can tweak it. People can do things like cyclical ketotarian or seasonal or uh, there's so much nuance to that conversation. It's not one size fits all. And then obviously the tailoring of vegan, vegetarian, and pescatarian, you can kind of make it your own. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you like that approach where it's a, a hybrid approach where there's times when you may be more vegan, but then you may become a little bit more vegetarian or then pescatarian and you sort of just naturally um, go between the different ways of eating potentially. But as you said, mainly plant-based is, is the, the real crux, the foundation here that you found to, to be the most beneficial. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that is well put. Okay. And um, when you were talking about the, the vegan options there too, with your experience now, do you, do you think it is that like a, another difficulty level to stay vegan keto though um, because you have to be so much stricter or more diligent in your nutrition and your sources of food? Yeah, it definitely takes more thoughtfulness and more care to making sure you're getting the proper amino acids. And that's not just vegan keto. That's, I would say, veganism at large. But I guess because we were removing a lot of the higher carbohydrates from a traditional, conventional vegan diet in ketotarian, they're going to have to be thoughtful of a few things. Now, for some people, that's great and they they enjoy that they love that way of eating they feel the best where they they eat there and that's the maybe the personal preference as well for ethical reasons or religious reasons or just they just want to do it intellectually so uh and you talk about um, my friend uh, dr diolis carrie diolis she is vegan keto uh and she feels fantastic there and but she is thoughtful uh, about her food choices so hopefully with because the majority of ketotarian is vegan keto, like there's 81 some recipes, over half of that is vegan keto. There's a lot of options there. So I wanted to give them a resource if they wanted to do it. But so that thoughtfulness is already put into there. Uh, there. But yes, as a general rule, there's less options. You're not having eggs. You're not having ghee. You're not having wild caught fish. So they're going to have to be more um, specific about the foods that they pick from. Mm. And I know a lot of questions always um, from people who maybe are eating a more animal-based way is just, where do you get the protein? Like, how do you get enough protein when, you, when you're um, eating many plant-based foods? Do you have any tips on your best ketogenic sources of protein? Sure. So in completely the vegan keto like selection of foods, uh, a few things that I talk about in the book are nuts and seeds. I think a mixture of those plus vegetables, you're going to get a variety of the different amino acids, the essential amino acids that you're not going to get from food specifically. Spirulina is another, maybe uncommon not having a slab of spirulina, but you can add it to dishes and add it to drinks and, or they sell like tablets of them too. So you can have it that way. Uh, such a inchi, which is like a Brazilian, like a South American uh, peanut nut. Uh, that is a great source of, of amino acids. And something that I allow for in the uh, vegan keto track of ketotarian are fermented n organic non GMO soy like tempeh and natto, which are other good, completely vegan keto uh, protein sources. Uh, and the hemp variations of them, like the hempe and the hemp foo, which Dr. Diolis and I have talked about those <laughs> options for the people. So we, we, we came up with a good list of complete proteins, 
for them to get uh, in this way of eating. Okay, and you list all of that in the book for for anyone who's who needs to know. And then, oh, yeah. and then the same it comes with fats because I think a lot of people just think, do you just end up drowning all your food in olive oil or coconut oil just to get that level of fat up? Yeah, so there, there's olives and olive oil and avocados, avocado oil, and then coconut and coconut oil, and then nuts and seeds op- 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 as well. Uh, so there's a good variety. I mean, most of the fats that I think people should be focusing on, whether they're vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, or not uh, there's some just traditional keto i think those are really the some of the best fats to focus on um and then obviously there's the eggs and the the fish for the people that are still want to be ketotarian but ha- or have other options too mm-hmm. and so when someone is more pescatarian uh, keto are they just having a little bit of fish um or c- could they have a, a a meal which is predominantly um seafood or fish based I think there it, it comes to that own personal experimentation. Where do they feel the best at? People have different requirements, nutritionally speaking, as far as where their body's at, what deficiencies they have, how's their gut health, what's their starting point. And I definitely have seen people that are eating fish throughout the day to really rehabilitate, getting those bioavailable omega fats and using that food as medicine. They're having it more than then the next person that's maybe using the fish as like more of like a condiment or like a side dish, it's still very more plant centric, but it's a, just a little piece of seafood. Uh, so it really depends on the, the context of what the person's going through and how they're using food as medicine. Generally speaking, I would say that most people, especially readers now that I'm, the book's been out a little, you know, a couple of months and I'm seeing how people are doing it and just feedback from people that aren't my patients. This is the first thing for me. I've never uh, written a book before um, that they are using the fish more of a side dish every once in a while. It's not like they're doing it. Uh, t- it's still plant centric. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I was also uh, wondering there um, how much food in a day. So, you know, so, you know just to give you some context. I've spoken to some, some people on the other spectrum of the ketogenic world, or um, like the carnivore ketos, who are mainly meat-based ketogenic, and they can eat a lot of meat in a day. Do you get the same when you're more on a plant-based ketogenic side of things, or are you? Do you have just enough calories, like two thousand calories a day, or are, you know, are you eating massive bowls of uh, salad or vegetables or something like that? My obviously it also depends on the person and their energy output and metabolism and all of that stuff, but and their age. But my what I'm seeing and how the meal plan structured in ketotarian and how I'm seeing people doing it in real life on, via social media now, um, they're not eating a lot of food. And one thing that I've seen clinically that I'm very glad that people are doing it properly when they get the book and using the meal plan is that they are well satiated the way that we structured everything eating a average amount of food it's not an extreme amount of food because as we know fat is very satiating so even the something that looks like hey this is a decent meal but i probably couldn't be filled off of this they are filled surprisingly enough to them um i find that the carnivore ketogenic diet uh if especially if it's higher protein, it's not as satiating, generally speaking, generally speaking, especially for somebody that's even gone from a conventional ketogenic diet, that's more concerned with moderating protein. I find that what I've heard from people is that when they go to more of a conventional ketogenic diet to carnivore diet, they are more hungry. And they are having to eat more meat to maintain that satiety. Um, Actually, my co I co host a podcast called keto talk um and jimmy moore's the co-host of it but he has another show called keto hackers uh, uh, md i think it's called and he has another uh doctor on the show and they did that for a week they they did the carnivore diet and that's what they both uh noticed as well as that they needed to eat more food um and that they were more hungry so that's that may be something there may be something to that okay and i'm just also wondering um when we're talking about the different ways of eating, it sounds like it, it is you, you're guided more by personal uh, preference on the person side, the patient side. Um, 
if a patient doesn't have a sort of um, ethical preference or anything like that, they just want to get healthy, um, do you, using lab tests then, use the functional medicine side of things, do you end up finding that you go one of the three different routes, either vegan, vegetarian, or pescatarian, even if the person doesn't have an ethical um, reason why they might want to be vegan, you're just guided by the lab results. Um, I'd be interested to sort of understand or listeners to understand like what kind of lab results would push you in what type of direction? Yeah. So I think that when you're talking about the food medicines of wild caught fish and um, even eggs for people that don't have an albumin sensitivity, uh, but getting the choline and the bioavailable omega fats from the egg yolk specifically, even if you just had the egg yolk and you remove the white, which is more antigenic for some people or sensitive for some people, not everybody. Certainly it's a superfood. Um, but um, with that said, I think that these vegetarian keto, pescatarian keto fat sources are really healing and very therapeutic for people using food as medicine. So I would typically recommend still plant centric but to drive inflammation levels down or to improve hormonal function or brain function, to bring in more of a pescatarian uh, keto option, I call it in the book is vegetarian. You're still plant centric, but <laughs> it's another horrible play on words. Uh, but the it's you're having this fresh fish and clean seafood, and so I think from a mineral, fat soluble vitamin standpoint, uh, and a protein standpoint too, a complete protein standpoint, it can be very healing. Mm -hmm. And do you think animal-based products then can stimulate inflammation? Because we're, we're talking a lot about that as a as a parameter why we want to eat this way to help things. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have you found that animal-based products, either meat or eggs or something like that, can be pro-inflammatory? Yeah, it can be. So there's a few things that you would want to look at just from a general standpoint. Sometimes people with gut problems like uh, intestinal permeability or just chronic gut issues, even if they're not you know, extreme, there's just a certain level of gut dysfunction that the intestinal permeability issues or leaky gut syndrome, depending so much on saturated fats from red meat and I would say dairy and even the way that people are doing the butter coffees and having a lot of that. And from a plant-based standpoint, too much coconut oil, this I've seen drive inflammation up and it has to do with gram negative bacteria and increasing inflammation um, because of that. Uh, so that mixture of gut problems, gram negative bacteria, and too much saturated fats, I've seen drive inflammation levels up on people. And there's scientific literature to kind of back that up as well. And then obviously with genetic components like APOE4, like the genetic allele there, those people are increased risk for inflammation, cardiovascular problems, and Alzheimer's when they're depending too much on saturated fats, mainly from animal sources. So those people, what are they to do then? Are they good to abandon the a ketogenic approach or low carb approach because of these issues? No, it's just where are you getting your fat sources so that I would say the solution there would be to focus more on these plant-based keto options. Uh, so you don't have to abandon, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and just abandon all. And it's a failure and it's, it's something you shouldn't try. No, there's other ways to tweak it for your body. Um, and that's really what your show is really all about. How can you find out what, how, where your body functions the best and what your body hates and stick to what it loves. Uh, and that's really also, my job as a functional medicine practitioner to see what that is for the individual. But these are some things that people have to consider depending too much on animal products. If, if they run labs and they see these labs aren't moving in the right direction, if they see their like NMR panel, the, the subfractionation of the lipid particles, if they're in pattern B and they're in this sort of oxidized inflamed state, if they see their triglycerides or their cholesterol get super high, uh, and it's not the good pattern. It's not pattern A, it's pattern B. They're going to have to adjust it. And what I've seen is that people adjust from the conventional ketogenic diet to more of a ketotarian way of eating. These labs improve very nicely, but they're still getting the benefits of ketosis, which they love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's interesting you're bringing up um, the, the cholesterol patterns there because 
Um, I don't know what the percentage is, but um, I've had Dave Feldman on. I, d- I don't know if you know Dave from Cholesterol Code, you know, and he he's looked at lean mass hyperresponders, and when people go on a ketogenic diet and their cholesterol goes up a lot, um, and everyone's always wondering, is it bad or is it not? But it, um, I also see when people go on a carnivore keto way that their cholesterol levels go up, but. I, I'm guessing you can get the exact same when you are on a more plant-based ketogenic diet that you can get very high cholesterol levels too and potentially could you even get that, that abnormal pattern on a plant-based situation too? It's more unlikely and it depends on how much they are depending on coconuts, I would say, more than anything. If they're more coconut oil-based, I've seen that. Um, and But if they're depending more on avocado oil, avocados, olives, olive oil, I haven't seen that pattern be uh, really at all uh, that I can think of at the top of my head. Um, I would say it, if it does happen, it's a lot less likely. But you can still get the high cholesterol levels even being plant-based keto. Yes, you you can. It's Again, I would say less likely as well, focusing on more on the monster, monounsaturated fats and the polyunsaturated like omega fats. I find that that is, uh, even if you see an increase, the pattern is better. Uh, their HDL looks great. They're in pattern A, the non-oxidized subfractionation there, uh, and their triglycerides are nice and low. So everything sort of, even if it overall comes up, I don't see it extreme. And it, even if it's a slight elevation, but the context and the ratios are all good. And so with coconut oil, is it because it's got more saturated fats in there that you're thinking about? Because an, another thing um, I have come across recently is that MCT oils can aggravate certain people too. Um, it sounds like this is all in the same realm. Absolutely, yeah. So again, I love coconut oil. There's nothing, I'm not demonizing coconut oil at all. It's, it's something that we use in ketotarian, but I just think some people do best to limit it. And for some people, if they just want to err on the side of, I don't want to even go there, maybe they don't even really enjoy it, the taste of it. Maybe they want to go for more of these other fat options, and that's fine. But no, I mean, the coconut oil has great healing properties as well, but it's just a matter of what works for your body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know a lot of people, especially when they adopt a ketogenic lifestyle, they may look to MCT oils to try to just raise their ketone levels up and get that fat intake. But for you, that you wouldn't necessarily utilize a lot of MCT oils on a ketotarian way of eating? We, we recommend it as a way to, if someone's having trouble getting in ketosis or they want more of the sort of cognitive amplification uh, and, and biohack that way, I think it can be a fine thing to use. Um, but you always want to make sure that it's, it's, it's not negatively impacting them. Is it too much for their physiology or is it just right? I think most of the time, because MCT oil is such a small amount and, and, and if the person's doing it in normal ratios, I don't see it being a big detriment. I'm thinking more from a coconut oil standpoint when they're really cooking it, it's in all of their food. It's, it's like lathering in the vegetables. That can be problematic for some people if they do that breakfast, lunch, and dinner too much. So I think they should diversify the fat sources, not demonizing coconut oil, just diversification, I think is the message here. Okay. And I just want to come back to the inflammation point that you were talking about with the gut, especially with the microbiome there. Um, So I got to interview uh, a doctor out of Hungary and um, they use what they call a paleo ketogenic approach, which is predominantly um, meat and organ base with uh, and it's um, very fat based animal fat based um to actually heal intestinal permeability um and just reading some of the comments that users who are eating that way they're talking about how they've noticed removing plant matter helped the inflammation in their gut but do you, have you found then that certain plants maybe are the more aggravating on the gut where whereas maybe if um, someone who did feel that plants were aggravating their gut if they ate certain types of plant-based foods it wouldn't maybe create such an aggravating effect mm-hmm. no and i think that's the the bigger picture from a functional medicine standpoint in my practice and coaching people uh, virtually is that I do not hang my hat on one way of eating for everybody. And I think there's a time and a place for a more carnivore diet because it is what is it? It's the ultimate elimination diet. You're removing a lot of variables and people's, certain people's guts and immune systems and these food reactivities are so 
extreme that they are reacting to the most you know innocuous benign vegetable plant food um, so we're looking at things like histamines and oxalates and lectins and phytic acid and all that stuff yeah i mean that's for removing that for a while or at least cooking them down the vegetables down, having them pureed, having them soft and cooked in broth. And that's one non-vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian food that I put in ketogenic was bone broth because it is so healing and soothing to the gut. So you can have lots of soups and stews uh, and be still collagen rich, which is good for the microbiome and good for the body from a protein source and very tolerable to these people with gut problems. Uh, so having these soups and stews that still can be plant, have plants in them but it's very digestible and soft and easy to digest for uh, someone with these gut issues. But to the larger point, I think even if you removed the vegetables entirely for a time, there are times when I put people on a carnivore diet while we're healing their gut. But the goal is you have to heal your gut. You have to be multi-pronged and be actively uh, improving the microbiome and the gastrointestinal system so you can, what's long-term wellness look like for that person? It's not to be on the carnivore diet. Uh, so you can use it as a tool, but it has to be put in its place. What, why, what, we're, what we're talking about with ketotarian is more of a lifestyle, long-term wellness, not the ultimate elimination diet, which I would say the carnivore diet is that because you're removing a lot of variables um, out as far as food is concerned. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like... Um you're considering that the plants themselves aren't a causative factor in creating the intestinal permeability. They just happen to be along for the ride and stimulating things that there's other factors that led to that issue to begin with. That's why putting them on a carnivore way of eating helps to heal the gut lining. Once the gut lining is healed, you can introduce plant-based foods back in again and you shouldn't get those reactions. Absolutely. So it's less to do with the food, more to do with the the gut reactivity that's going on, the gut problems. And that's my experience is when the person gets things calmed down, they can start reintroducing things, plant foods, and they do fine. And again, not everybody has to go that extreme to be a completely carnivore anyways. They just have to then cook down their vegetables, have them soft, more of like a gaps-like approach um, where you're having broths and soups and stews, but there's still vegetables in them. Is that maybe the, the, the best way to consume vegetables is that you need to cook them quite well um, so that you, even if you don't think you have an intestinal permeability issue, that you don't create a potential for it um, if you, by making sure the way that you cook your vegetables is optimal? I would say the majority of people, yes, that's, that is true. Okay. Um, yeah, and I was also just wondering then, um, do you do a lot of testing with ketones and glucose? Um, I'd be interested to find out if you find certain vegetables or f I don't know if you even introduce certain fruits, if they have quite a, a dramatic effect on your ketone levels or your glucose levels. Yeah, so it's something that from a patient standpoint, yes, we're tracking that and looking at serum insulin, looking at C-peptide, looking at glucose levels, looking at ketones and tracking all of that on spreadsheets. <laughs> we get super nerdy here from a data standpoint and making sure patients are improving and achieving their health goals. But uh, in the book specifically, I just, I gave people the option. If they want to keep it simple and not get super data minded, then they can just keep it simple, focus on the foods, go off of how they feel. And I think a lot of times people, that resonates with a lot of people. And then there are a lot of biohackers, and that's a lot of my patients. So I wanted to also give them general things to look out for from a, a lab standpoint, whether that is running A1C and triglycerides, HDL, getting a baseline there, or just a day-to-day -day glucose and ketone standpoint too. So it's really, for me, what where does that patient thrive on? And some people love the data and they want to get into it. And that's honestly most of my patients. But I realized that there's a, another side of, of life that that stuff creates anxiety and stress for them. Uh, and they don't get, you know, geeking out. They don't get geeked out by that stuff. It actually adds to their anxiety and stress, which isn't good for their health. So you have to kind of realize, okay, what how much information is too much information and you kind of have to, that's part of my job of tweaking that and making this 
sustainable for them. Mm -hmm. And if they feel like a certain way of eating isn't sustainable, it's not going to be sustainable and they're going to do it for a little bit and then they'll get burned out and then they'll think the whole thing's a failure, but it's just, they were going about it wrong for them. Uh, so that's the things that I think about at night. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, when you were also just talking about earlier with, um, with the meat and the dairy, it just got me thinking, how much do you consider the sourcing of the vegetables? Um, so what I'm looking at here where people might have a problem with animal based products because of, uh, maybe some antibiotic use in the animals or, you know, what they were eating. Do you think that has also the same kind of issue in um, the vegetarian, vegan, uh, keto way of eating that you want to be looking specifically for organic fruits or uh, organic vegetables, that that kind of thing, so that you're avoiding any chemical load from from consuming so many vegetables? Yeah, I think so. Um, So you want to... And we mentioned this in the book that you would want to go for the environmental working group, EWG. They do, they update their list every, every year. And you really, I'd say if it's clean, go, go for the clean 15. Uh, You can go for conventional if you want to, maybe there's not the organic option or make sure that you wash it. Well, uh, if it's from the, the dirty dozen list. So I think looking at resources, picking the best you can uh, and, that's what you should do for plant foods. And that's what you should do for animal products too. And we have to do the best we can, right? I mean, we live in a very dirty world when it comes to food supply. So and it's that, that, that double edged sword where yes, educate yourself, do the best you can. But then at that point, you need to just give the rest up and not be so stressed about it. Because I really think that orthorexia is a problem in wellness world when you're talking about this stuff. Some people, they thrive on that and it's not, education is a good thing and they want to make the best informed decisions and it's not creating stress and anxiety. But that same information can create a lot of stress and anxiety and orthorexia, which is this fear of eating even healthy food. And I think that's part of the conversation with Keto Terry and I really wanted to be the ethos of how can you use food to really nourish your body with great food medicine, but not create this stress and anxiety, this negative connotation with eating which is antithetical to wellness. So I, that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, no, it, it does um, saying that, yeah, if you can get it, but also don't hyper-focus on it because you're, co- you're going to cause yourself stress and anxiety by trying to over-focus on the quality of the vegetables potentially. Exactly. Do the best you can. And it depends on what access you have to food. And I think the overwhelming benefits of real food outweigh any negatives, even if it's not the best source. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested too, I got to travel recently through the US and go through some of the big cities and I was just looking at how hard it is to get fresh food when you live in, in a big city. Um, I was in New York, for example, there because there's just not there's not big supermarkets and grocery stores. Um, it didn't seem like it when you're walking around. Do you think it's slightly more difficult to eat a ketotarian way of eating in a big city versus maybe a more rural setting? No, I don't actually. I, I I don't. You may have to go to different um, places, but I mean, New York City has some amazing farmers markets, and people come from outside of the city to Union Square and these different sections. I've seen, like, I've walked through some amazing farmers markets in New York City. You would think, well, it's New York City; it's not <laughs> going to be filled with farms. But it's funny that a lot of the because it's such an epicenter, these farms come from outside of the city and are selling their produce. So no, you can just go to a farmer's market in uh, uh, New York City just fine. And obviously there is Whole Foods and you know independent health food stores as well. Um, but no, I don't see it as any different. Honestly, on the flip side, if someone's really rural, they don't have any, sometimes the farmer's markets aren't that great and they don't have tons of organic produce or they don't have tons of health food stores with the cool, uh, you know, packets of almond butter or these convenient foods that are ketotarian, they aren't actually as readily available in really the, the countryside. And, you know, I'm from the country outside of Pittsburgh, and I know how that that's like. Uh, it's not as ideal. But we live in a time where you can order things online. And I think that's the one 
uh, saving grace there, where if you can't get that cool convenience food, not that you even need that, but maybe people just like the easy convenience uh, you know, packets of whatever or things for traveling, they can just order online. But no, I don't see uh, a problem whether someone's living urban or in the country. Okay. Um, breakfast wise, are you a fan of someone having a daily breakfast or more skipping breakfast and eating later in the day? So I talk about in the book in Ketotarian that to play around with intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding and really making it your own. And where do you feel the best as to use that as a tool to amplify your health? Um, but so I intermittent fast every morning. So that's something that I love. I don't wake up feeling hungry. I eat around noon and it's something that I enjoy. I ha I'll have like Earl Grey tea in the morning um, because the, the bergamot in, in the uh, Earl Grey tea has been shown to enhance autophagy. So intermittent fasting plus ketosis plus bergamot and Earl Grey tea. I see it in my mind at least as like amplification of autophagy. And then, you know, I break my fast at lunch. Some people love the art of breakfast. Some people enjoy that and they want to wake up and, and have that art of breakfast. So there's no shame in that. Then they would just eat a good ketotarian breakfast and, and enjoy that. And maybe they don't do that every day. Maybe that's a weekend thing and they will fast during the week. So I re really want wellness to be enjoyable and in alignment with what your personal um, preferences are because that is good for the mind. It's good for the your heart and your spirit of just enjoying all of this. It's not arduous. It's not restrictive. It's not, you know, just miserable. They can really make the most out of it. So that's, I want people to have the grace and the lightness to pick what they want. But personally, I think intermittent fast in the morning for myself is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically when someone adopts a new way of eating too, it's um, they're always concerned about the hunger things. Like, am I going to, I don't want to feel hungry on this when I'm eating this way. Um, do you also recommend to patients then that you, you've got to eat to satiety, eat to hunger feeling? Um, don't try, force yourself only to eat a little bit and you're still left hungry. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's an important thing is eat until satiety and being in, uh, in tune with your body and being conscious with how your body feels. Because especially when people make the change to a new way of eating, even if they're going from a conventional ketogenic diet to more of a ketotarian approach, and especially if they're going from the standard Western diet to a low carb or ketogenic approach, they are changing the sources of the foods and the calories and that they're focusing on oftentimes I find the people that are irritable and hangry and feeling fatigued shifting to this way of eating, they just aren't eating enough food. They're not fully there yet because they were dependent so much on other things for their calories. They're just not eating until satiety. Uh, so that's one thing that I would uh, consider uh, for people um, because they that's important. Eating until satiety is an important thing. And as the someone becomes more fat adapted, as you know, intermittent fasting will just randomly happen because you're not as hungry. You're not as hangry anymore. And you're off of that sort of volatile blood sugar roller coaster. And it's not even like something you even really are trying to do. You're just eating when you're hungry and you're eating until you're satiated. And these are just very simple things that we point out in the book that people can start being mindful of uh, when they start eating this way mm, so it's it, so i guess the takeaway there is it's a journey you may fa find in the beginning that you may eat, feel like you need to eat a lot just because you're trying to re-nourish your body but then give it a few months and then you end up in this natural intermittent fasting cycle and your your own eating pattern Absolutely. So what will serve you at the beginning of this journey won't necessarily be needed or wanted later on. And as your body is shifting to from being a sugar burner to being a fat burner, getting the benefits of ketosis, you have that metabolic flexibility. And some people have great metabolic flexibility. Some people have better metabolic flexibility, not, not entirely there yet. So you have to kind of see where you're at at that point and uh, really... Um, yeah, eat, eat when you're hungry. I think that's the main thing. Eat when you are hungry. Eat until you're satiated for the average person. And then there are some people that want to push into the basics, uh, beyond the basics of doing longer fasts. And they're, they may be hungry during those longer fasts, but they have that foundation that they've already been there. This is not the beginning of their journey. They want to push in further into fasting. And I think that can be great too. I just wouldn't recommend that 
uh, for the beginner or even the, the moderate person is, is to eat when you're hungry and to use it, use intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding in a healthy, sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to um, some of the products, you, you mentioned nut butters earlier, it just got me thinking of butter in general, but um, are you a fan of vegan butters at all? No, <laughs> no, no. As a general rule, no. If you look at the ingredients, it's pretty uh, murky. I, I wouldn't recommend them. It was a lot of canola oil, a lot of uh, industrial seed oils. No, I think there are probably better ones out there uh, that are exceptions to that rule. But the general rule, what I've seen at least, is that they're really filled with a lot of inflammatory pro omega six junk food. Um, and just because something's vegan, just as the same as just because something's keto doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, healthy. Mm -hmm. And nut butters, are you a fan of using nut butters? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I think that almond butter and macadamia nut butter and all those great nut butters uh, can be a really good, easy snack for people to have um, and well tolerated by most people. Mm -hmm. But um, do you find it's the same thing again if someone's primarily eating a ketotarian way for weight loss that they could go too too heavy, too much on the nut butters which could cause them to stall in their weight loss? Definitely. Yeah, that's a good point. I have seen that before. And for those people, we have to cut it back. They're overdoing their own being on the nut butters. <laughs> and I, I definitely, there's checks and balances for that. Uh, and I have definitely, we have this conversation as a team. We start looking at food logs and on spreadsheets and we start seeing more and more nut butters. It's like a great thing, but it shouldn't be like the primary, uh, you're like eating nut butter all day long. Because I have seen that impact people that want to lose weight. Some people, not a problem. They can have the nut butters and enjoy it and not a big deal. But yeah, from a weight loss standpoint, I have seen that be a little tweak that we need to make. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, I mean, you've shared so many actionable tips already and lots of good elements to this. Um, if someone does want to adopt a more vegan way or vegetarian way, um, how could they get in contact with you or follow you? Yeah. So everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. So links to Ketotarian are on there, but it's on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and all the independent bookstores. But there are also video classes if people want to be more plant-based keto on the website. And then they can set up a, a consultation as well uh, virtually uh, to talk about their health case and that's some of the labs that we talked about here too. So yeah, everything's at drwillcole.com. Right. So they, so you do do telemedicine where a, a patient can consult you. Yeah, that's my, that's my day job. Uh, <laughs> writing up books isn't my day job. So it's primarily 90% of our patients are seen virtually and that's what I do throughout the week. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'll be linking to all of that in the show notes and the description area. But I just want to say thank you again for sharing all your great information. Um, I love your way of thinking too. Um, and again, I think you're, you're going to answer a lot of questions that people have who want to eat a more plant-based ketogenic diet. So again, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for having me.